Amen. So like I said, we're in a, a series called Together, and this is the fourth message in, to, in Together. We have one more next week, and then uh, following that, we're actually going to have a Sunday dedicated to our missionaries and the missionaries that we are looking to send out from North Coast Church. So we're going from a series called Together to a series called Scatter, as God sends His Word out through us as a church and through our ministries out and our missionaries out into, into the world. So let's get into the word today. If you have, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. I'll read for us. It's just a short passage this morning, and then we s- we'll spend some time in God's word together. So Acts chapter 2, we're down at verse 41, and here is what it says. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added, to the, uh, added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, um, I'll forgive you for not assuming uh, from where you're sitting that I am, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, six foot three. I know from where you're sitting I might appear to be six foot three. In fact, I'm actually five foot eight. Five I'm not six foot three. And so now that you know that I'm five foot eight, um, you would be forgiven for uh, not assuming that my favorite sport growing up in high school, as I went through high school, and the sport that I played the most was, was basketball, the tall man's game. And yet I did play a lot of basketball. And the thing that I loved about basketball wasn't so much the winning and wasn't so much the victories because the reality is I was in a team where I wasn't the shortest. In fact, I was one of the tallest. So winning was just a happy thing that happened at the end of a a lucky game. What I loved about my team was if I was to consider for myself what a dream team would look like, it would be this team. And again, it wasn't because we won every match and we had the most ridiculous points on the board. It was simply because of the kind of team that we were, the kind of team that we were together. And yes, the more we played, the better we got, and the more points we scored, and the more victories we had. But towards the end of my high school career, um, and my basketball career, it's as close as I'm going to get to any sporting career, the closer we got to the end, we realized it was was more about the team, my dream team. And and we had this, this coach, he was actually my youth pastor at the time, he was tall, about six foot five. He had played a lot of basketball, the guy from the States. And what he did was he instilled a bunch of principles and things that if we put in place, there would be an outcome that we would get to enjoy as a team. And so we did. And one of the, the most important things that he taught us was this idea of live as a team, die as a team. Live as a team, die as a team. Which means if you rock up to practice late, it's not just you that is punished, but the whole team on the line, ready, three, two, one, whistle goes, and you're running sprints, running sprints, running sprints. Don't be late again. Do you get it? Yes. If you are swearing on the court, on the line, running sprints again and again and again. Our team got very good at expressing itself through words like, oh, gee, goodness, um, and oh, gosh, darn. Well, even that one would be on the line running. Running for any offense, because live as a team, die as a team. That's what it was. But what's happened over time was we realized as well we needed the team because when one person scored, the points reflected for the whole team on the board. We needed each other for the dream team to work. And we continued to do life together on the court. And then a lot of those kids ended up up coming to my youth group. And then we ended up just spending life together as a team. In fact, there were people in the school, people in my youth group, people that just knew of us, that wanted to be on our team who had never played basketball before. They just wanted to be around this team, this, this dream team. It's as close as I get, I guess, I've ever come to being a part of a dream team. But the things that were applied to that team made all the difference. Now today, the verses that we've just read, Luke, who records these things for us, he gives us four things that describe the dream team of churches. In fact, the very first church. And here's the reality. 
if you and me, if we, all of us together can put these things into practice, then this church, this church will be the dream team, or better, this church will be the church that Jesus has called us to be. But before we get back into this passage today, we've got a little bit of catching up to do. Because last week in our series together, we were looking at what it meant to worship for the people at Mount Sinai. And so I'm going to do my best in a couple minutes to catch us up from where we are in Exodus all the way up to Acts chapter 2. And if you're holding a Bible, if you know anything about the Bible, you know there's a couple pages in between. So bear with me. We're going to try and fast forward all the way through, and I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a summary of where we are now. So like I said, the people were gathered at Mount Sinai, we saw that last week, where God has brought his people out of slavery through the leadership of Moses. They gathered at the mountain, and we learned last week that this is where we get to see so many great principles about worship. But what God was doing is he was taking his people under the leadership of Moses, and he was taking them from slavery to the promised land, an incredible transition, something that should have taken a very short amount of time, but... From the very beginning, we see something that is common amongst God people, God's people, and that is disobedience. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any amount of time, you realize, unfortunately, that God's people disobey. And as a result of their disobedience, what, hap- what, what happens? Well, instead of a short period of time from there going from captivity to the promised land, they find themselves wandering in the desert for 40 years. But eventually... God gives victory to Israel, and he gives over leadership to Joshua, and they enter into Canaan, the promised land, where they go, this is great. Everything the Lord says we will do, we'll obey him and we'll serve him, and then they do until they don't. And what happens? Well, when God's people disobey, things don't go their way. And in that time, God then sent in a series of judges who would come and set things right for his people, and they would, and the people would come back to God. But after a while, the people didn't want to judge. In fact, they didn't even want a God who was their king. They wanted a physical king. And so they said to God, give us an actual man, human king. And God says eventually, okay, I'll do that. I'll give you a king. But one day, there will come one who is better. There will come a king in the line of David, a one who will redeem and restore and save, ultimately the perfect king. And as time goes on, obviously, through the kings and through the people, disobedience and sin creeps in until eventually the kingdom is divided into the north and to the south. And after some time, the north is invaded and they are scattered, eventually lost. The southern kingdom, Judah, is then taken into exile in Babylon. And it is at this point that we think, oh no, it's all over. Scattered, in exile, how on earth can people be together? How can people gather to, with, with God as, as their, their, their true leader, king, together? They don't have a they, It seems like it's the end of the story, except it's not, because God allows them to come out of exile, return, rebuild the temple, and then again it seems like things are starting to turn around. So as we get right towards the end of the Old Testament, what starts to happen is we start to see that in the 400 years from the Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament, God's people are continually going through the cycle again of obedience and and repentance. And even though there's very little recorded for us in the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we do know that the church, not yet church, but God's people were continually finding themselves under siege or under attack or under hardship. And even within themselves, they had divided beliefs and they had divided teachings, all the while in the background waiting for the promised Messiah to come. Cue Jesus. Jesus, born in the town of David, in a manger. And right from the very beginning, God's people should have known that this was the one who was promised to come, but they didn't. They didn't see it. And then he grew up. He began to teach. He began to preach. He began to call disciples and followers. He then began to talk of the kingdom that was to come. He was the promised Messiah King. But still the people did not recognize him as king. And so eventually he's handed over to the Romans, and we know how this goes. He's hung on a cross, abandoned, alone, and dies without a single follower. 
it really seems like this is the end of the story for God's people, right? Because not only are there no followers, the God man himself is dead. How on earth can there be a together if there isn't even a people to be together or a God for them to be together around? But we know the story. On the third day, what happens? He raises to life and in doing so proves that he is in fact who he said he is and that for all, even you and me today, for all who call on the name of the Lord, there is salvation in his name. And then he spends some time with his followers. Acts chapter one tells us there are about 120 of them. And after that, he ascends to heaven with the promised Holy Spirit that will come and empower his people. All of this happening about 1,480 years after his people first gathered at Mount Sinai. Now, why bother with that summary? Why bother with that story? Here is why. Here's why we're gonna bother with that story. Because God's plans are not changed by disobedient people, stopped by opposing nations, or weakened by history. Like I said when we started out, unfortunately, one of the most common characteristics of God's people is their obedience. But God is gracious enough and powerful enough to work in spite of their, even in spite of our disobedience. And as long as God claims to be who he says he is, there will be nations and people who will try to oppose him and his own people. But, but God cannot and God will not be stopped. And that's a great promise for us because we understand this, that he also, his plans cannot be weakened by history. You see, as time goes on, it is not like as history increases and as distance travels between events that the things of God turn into some kind of myth or fable or legend. That's not the case when it comes to God's plan. In fact, the exact opposite is true because this story today picks up at the festival of Pentecost, which came to, among other things, commemorate the giving of the law all the way back at Mount Sinai. And although, like I said in Acts chapter one, it said there were only about 120 Jesus followers at the time, there were thousands and thousands of Jews from all around flooding into the city. They were coming to celebrate the festival. We spoke about this two weeks ago uh, as Steve preached through, through together, bad together, but they were all coming together, all of them, different tribes and nations, different tongues. And what happens here? The Holy Spirit is given. Signs and wonders and miracles are given to the apostles and also the ability to speak in the language of those who had come in, the thousands of Jews who had gathered for Pentecost. And so listening to what is being said, they recognize their own language being preached. And so what do they say? They say, what's going on? How is it possible that, that I'm hearing you preach in my own language? And then seizing the opportunity, obviously it's Peter, right? He grabs the mic, grabs his, his uh, Bible app, and he flicks all the way across to Joel. Don't worry, they didn't have phones of Bible apps back there. He would have memorized this. All the way to the prophet Joel. And he says, everybody, listen, listen up. And now, obviously, he's got their attention. And he begins to preach. And he begins to tell them that this is the day prophesied all the way back in Joel. Joel the prophet told of this day coming where there would be signs and wonders and the spirit would come and salvation would be available for everyone because the Jesus that they had just crucified was in fact the long promised Christ, the Messiah who would come. All prophesied 800 years before. God's plans are not weakened by even 800 years of history. It is all coming about. In fact, verse 36, this is what it says just a couple of verses earlier. This is now Peter speaking to everyone who has gathered it for, for Pentecost. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And he points out to all of them. And then there's this, I guess, tension in the air as he waits to see the response. Because if you read on in the rest of Acts, this message didn't always go down very well. But what happened on this day? Look at the very next verses. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's happening here? 
What's happening here is almost 1,500 years later, after the time where God originally gathered his nation at Mount Sinai. And though, although it's been that, that long, although it's been that amount of time, and although there are only 120 Jesus followers sitting there when the day started like that, what happens? God says, watch this. You want to see a people gathered together? I'm going to suddenly add 3,000 people to this gathering, to this original church. Because look at what happens, and as we've already read. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. That is some kind of preaching. That is some kind of message. That is some kind of word. You see, because God's plans are not changed by disobedient people, they're not stopped by opposing nations, and they are not weakened by history. In fact, not long before this event, Peter, the same one who was preaching, he was spending time with Jesus and the other disciples. And Jesus would say to Peter, Peter, who do you say I am? And what does Peter say? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus would say to Peter, that is right, Peter. And I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And here you sit today. Over 2,000 years since Peter spoke those words, since Jesus spoke those words, and even though it has been that long, even though it's been that much time, we're not sitting here discouraged. We're not sitting here with our heads down. We're standing, adoring Jesus as we have been doing for 2,000 years, all the while, together, while God builds his church and adds to that number. How incredible is God that his plans are not changed, stopped, or weakened. We get to be his church here today. The follow-on of what happened at Pentecost. So, what about us? What about this church? Well, like I said when I started out, there are four things in this passage that are very evident and very obvious. But four things that the original early church was devoted to, that is, they had a serious, earnest persistence in these four things. And here they are, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. These four things show up in the later verses that we've, we've just read. And so the question today is, are we devoted to these four things. So what are them? Well, the first one, the teaching. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To what extent, though? To what extent did this first church devote themselves to the apostles' teaching? Well, to the extent that when they heard something, as it said in the previous verses, that cut their hearts, that convicted their hearts, they didn't run away from it. They didn't push it away. What did they do? They cried out, what shall we do? And after Peter told them in verse 38, like we just read, to repent, they actually did it. So what does this devotion look like? Devotion to this teaching looks like someone who hears it, who's convicted or cut by it, and then someone who actually is changed by it because they do it. That is what the devotion to this teaching looks like. But it's not just that. It's that there was a fear. There was an awe of the God who was behind the teaching of the apostles. Look at what it says in verse 43. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You see, these apostles, they were, they were, were God's authenticated messengers, and there was this awe. Some of your translations or your Bibles might say there was this fear, there was this wonder. As they saw the apostles performing these signs and these wonders, and teaching in their languages. Can you, can you imagine what that would have looked like? Just a bunch of normal dudes, all of a sudden doing stuff in front of everyone that makes you think you're at some kind of David Copperfield show, right? You're just like, I've never seen that one before. And, and, and things that were, were so amazing that it captivated them that they were fear, filled with all kinds of fear and awe at the very God who was behind the work of these apostles. I, I mean, I can't imagine what that day would have, would have looked like. But what about us today? I've, I've been going to church my whole life. I'm a pastor's kid. And I've witnessed some amazing things happen in the church. Amazing things like when we get together together and sing like we did earlier. 
to be able to praise God. I was thinking on the way to church today. There are songs that I've sung my whole life, and yet I still sing them. And each time I sing them, I, I feel like I know something more of who God is. And I want to worship Him because of just how great He is. As Rob said, 10,000 Reasons, it's a song we've sung forever and forevermore. But every time you sing it, you're kind of like, this is insane. I, you know, I've, I've, I've done that. I've, I've been at, at places where my heart has been convicted and changed. But I've, I've never seen anybody get up on stage and do anything that looks like something that resembles a Marvel movie. You know, I, like, I, there, I, I've never seen any kind of sign or, or wonder as, as we hear about in Acts chapter 2. So what about us today? What happens when we come to the teaching of God's word today? Well, the same God who spoke through the apostles is the very God who speaks through his word that you have on your lap that you have next to your bed, that you even have on your cell phone. That is the God who still speaks. And he speaks through the apostles, through his word, and not only just through them, but through the whole accounts of scripture. Because what we know of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all of scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is God's word to us, through us, and the scriptures that we have. So let me ask you this morning, when you come to God's word, is there this kind of awe, this kind of wonder, this kind of fear as he speaks, even as he breathes out his own words to us? Are you devoted to the teaching of God's word as we gather as church, as you gather as growth group, or as you simply open the Bible? and you read even what the apostles would have to say from their own mouths. Here's how you know if you are devoted to the teaching. When you hear it, you're cut by it. And then you do it. When you hear it, you're convicted by it. And then you allow that same word to heal you as you put it into practice and you do it. That's how you know. But here's how you know if you are not devoted to the teaching. If on a Sunday or in a growth group or whatever setting you are in, when God's word is open and is delivered to you, if you are more concerned about what the preacher is wearing, if you're more concerned about the email or the text or the conversation that you're going to have after the message, if you're more concerned about how you would have done a better job, if you're more concerned about tearing down then building up, then you're not devoted to the teaching. If that is the case, then if you're consistently finding fault with how God's word is taught, and I'm not saying that we don't listen to God's word being taught with discerning hearts, of course we do. But if there's a pattern in your life where you continually are finding fault, then one of two things are true. Either you are in the wrong gathering, either you're listening to the wrong preaching, or, or you have the wrong heart. Because for the early church, they did not stop their hearts from being cut. They heard what they did not want to hear. Their hearts were cut, and then they cried out, what shall we do? And then they did it. They were devoted to the teaching. But that's not all they were devoted to. Because it goes on. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and they devoted themselves to fellowship. Now, when we think of fellowship, we think of just a bunch of Christians being together in the same place at the same time. And I guess there is an element of that being true, and that's even spoken about in this passage. But that's not the first example. That's not the first expression of fellowship that is given. Because look at how our verses continue. We can jump to the next one and then to the next one. They devoted themselves to apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. And then, as we jump down to the next verse, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now that word common and the word fellowship that you're reading have the same root word. And so the question is this, if this is going to explain what fellowship looked like in that early church, what does the very next, next verse say? It says this, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That is what the very first example of togetherness, of fellowship looks like, of having in common looks like in the early church, an uncommon, common bond. That is what it looked like in the early church. You know what this is? 
This is, um, hey, love. Uh, that's not what me and Chris call each other. She's looking at me weird. Like, well, no, I'm talking, this is an example from the early church. Don't worry. Hey, love, you know that a couple that rocks up at church on Sunday? Oh, yeah, that, that new one with the, the two boys and, and, the, and the little girl? Yes, yes. Oh, you know, I heard that, um, I heard that they lost their, uh, their one donkey. I don't know. It always seems like people in these times, like the donkey was a thing. Anyway, so they lost their one, don and there's no ways for them to be able to get, you know, the kids to school and get to the market. It was the one donkey that they had. I mean, I wish there was a way we could help. Well, I mean, we've, we've got three donkeys out back, and that one just sits in the garage most of the time. In fact, I was thinking, uh, you know, how, what could we do with that one? Well, let's just give it to them. They, they can have it. I mean, we were trying to save up for, but you know what? They, 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 or let's just go sell it, and then we'll, we'll give them the money. Let them just do what they want with it. I, I mean, I know it sounds like a silly example, but that's exactly what it was. I'm going to sell something of mine and give to you because you need it. You know what this is? I was going to try to say this in a way that you wouldn't know it was me and cursed, but <laughs> this is a young married couple who, uh, after two uh, miscarriages, find themselves sitting in the doctor's office. And the doctor says, look, there's a way that this can go full term, but it's going to be a very expensive process because the medication is very expensive. And so that young couple doesn't know what that means, but when the top doctor says expensive, you know it's not like... He's not exaggerating. He's like, this is just the way it is. And so as we make our way to the, the pharmacy, and the pharmacist takes a script, and she's typing out behind the, behind the computer, all of a sudden she pauses, looks up at me and cursed, and has no idea what to say next. Because she actually knew us through my mom. And this pharmacist looks up and realizes that the amount of money that popped up on the screen is virtually impossible for us to ever pay. What we needed to pay for, for five months so that our tiny little baby and cursed tummy could survive was more than we could ever imagine having. And so we didn't pay for five months, we didn't even pay for five weeks, we didn't even pay for five days, we paid for three days. And then we went home knowing that we had three days, and God had three days to do something. And then out of absolutely nowhere, I get a phone call from a friend who says, I got you back. Pay for it all. It's all taken care of. Carry on. Every time, a lot of you guys don't know me or Soph or Ev or Kirst, every time I see my little girl running around, I think of this an uncommon, common bond as God's people share in fellowship together, not just around food, though we're going to talk about that in a second, and that's a good part of being a Christian, but by saying, you need it, I have it. Go on and take it. This is, I care so deeply for you that I'm willing to give you something at my own cost. You see, God has blessed every single one of us, not just to have what he has given us, but to hold it in a way that says, if you need this, i got your back. You can take it. You can have it. And you know what I love so much about this? This is, this is not about not having. This is simply about not having a hold on what you have. It's not about not having. It's not about, oh, poor Christians, we're just going to have to just, you know, just have absolutely nothing because there's no way God is going to bless us. Of course he has. It's not about not having, it's just about not having a hold in what God has put in our hands. You know what this is? This is exactly what I see at North Coast Church every single Sunday and every single week and all the time. Stories like Mike's story and Kirst's story being reflected in and through you guys as you see needs and as you plug holes and as you give to people who cannot help themselves, but it's okay because you and your family, maybe they can. And it might not even be through financial means. I mean, we, we've got this building here because this is something that you guys were willing to give into. We can be here today because it's something you're willing to give into. But me and Amitha were talking about this on Friday. This doesn't happen if you guys aren't willing to give of your time. To have this uncommon, common bond where you say, I have gifts and I have abilities and I have means in which I can serve the rest of the body. That is what fellowship looks like in this first early church. And so let me ask you, is this not something that you want to be a part of? 
Who was it that said it is better to give than it is to receive? Famous quote, famous guy. Jesus knew. Jesus knew, as we're going to see when we come to communion, the joy of giving. And the question is today, do you, as you come together and fellowship? And so they were devoted to teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. And then they were devoted to breaking bread. And this is probably what we might think fellowship looks a little bit more like in the church. Look at how it carries on. Uh, they, they were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and then dropping down to verse 46, this is what it says, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, whether the early church was actually able to physically come to the temple every single day or not, I'm not sure. Physically, just because of the sheer size and number of people, it would have almost been impossible. But that's not the point. The point is this. Corporate gathering, as we see in the church, the early church, corporate gathering, intimate relationships. That's what part of together is. This corporate gathering together and then these intimate relationships. Now, now for sure, breaking bread would refer to the breaking of bread around communion and the Lord's, the Lord's table, again, which is something we're about to do. But I think it is not just them remembering and reflecting on the, the message that Peter preached as the church was launched. Sure, they did that all the time. I think it was more than that. As they gathered with glad and generous hearts, what were they doing? They were simply eating together. They were simply sharing life together. They were enjoying life together. Like so many of you guys already do in your growth groups or as families come together and share life together in the church. Just like we want to do, like I said when I spoke through those three things earlier, the three things coming up in the life of our church. Works every time. Meet and greet. Our Sunday cafe launching thing on the 17th of October. And welcome lunch. Common denominator, we're breaking bread. And we are eating. And we are celebrating. And we're enjoying life together. There's nothing quite like the ability that we have to gather around good food. And, and can I just say, this is great food. Really great food. And you are going to be pleasantly surprised when you come to welcome lunch. And just the fact that we can go and hang out in the cafe after church and sit together and share a simple meal together, how great is that? Here is what I want to challenge you this week. Not even, okay, not even this week. That might be a little bit much. This month, I dare you. I dare you to think of one person one person in this church or one family in this church that you or your family are committed to breaking bread with. It can be as simple as getting a takeaway and hanging out in the park or inviting them for a coffee. I guess that coffee is a modern day breaking bread. Hey, should we go have a coffee? Yeah, you know you actually want to talk about other stuff, but we're going to have coffee together. I invite you to do that for one other person, one other, one other family. Or maybe you're going to go to a restaurant, you're going to eat together, or maybe, whoo, what about this one? Maybe you're going to invite them into your home. I know. I know. But I'm telling you now, if you do that, it will completely change the way you see and view and experience church together. Devoted to teaching, devoted to fellowship, devoted to breaking bread. But one more thing as we close out today. They were devoted to, to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. And the passage goes on, and it doesn't necessarily mention prayer specifically, but consider that whether they were together in the temple or together in their homes, what does verse 47 say they were doing? Praising God and having favor with all the people. They weren't gathering just for the sake of gathering, just for the sake of being together. They weren't even gathering just for the sake of ticking a religious box. Their togetherness was centered around what? As said earlier, their prayers and now revealed to us their praises. This, guys, church only works if we, if we are devoted to prayer. And not just the kind of prayer that says, God, will you help us? Will you give us? And will you be there for us? Though we do pray that and we should pray that. But the kind of praises that exalts him as the reason and as the joy of the very togetherness that we have in him and through his son. It's the very heart of together. In fact, it is so essential and effective that even the early church, people who had no idea who the person was sitting next to them, probably even struggled to understand what they were saying and definitely shared different cultural backgrounds. 
even them, for them, there was what? Favor with all the people. North Coast Church is their favor with all the people as we pray together and as we pray together. So let me ask you simply, are you devoted to pray? Are you devoted to prayer and praise that exalts God as the centerpiece of this gathering and the gatherings in your home? Is that a devotion that you have? Half an hour before every service that we have, we gather right up front here, and we pray for these very things. We ask that God will do great things amongst us, that he will speak to us, but then we also ask him that for everyone serving and everyone gathered, that they would see him and his son as a centerpiece of everything that happens. Guys, can you imagine, can you imagine just for a second, if we were devoted to these four things, teaching, standing in awe and wonder of the God that speaks to us still through his word, devoted to the point where we actually do what cuts our hearts and by his spirit puts it into practice. Can you imagine if we were devoted to the kind of fellowship that says, I got your back because everything I have has only been given to me by God and so if you're in need, I'm gonna help you out. And being the people who would look for those needs. Can you imagine if we even turn that fellowship into breaking bread where we actually spend time together with people that we maybe don't even really know? Can you imagine if we were a people that were devoted to prayer and the kind of praise that every time we gather together, we know without saying it, that God is the center of everything that we do. Can you imagine what might happen? Well, maybe, maybe God will do what he does when his church acts like his church together. Because what's the very last thing that we read? And the Lord, the Lord, he did it. The Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. I'm going to ask the band to come up and we're going to get ready to sing and then share in communion together. But as we're closing out today, I just, I want to encourage you that if, like the very early first church, if you feel your heart being prompted, even if it's just go ahead and invite them to lunch, if you feel your heart being pricked, man, I don't, I don't, I don't value Jesus as the centerpiece of every gathering. Or if you feel your heart being cut, there is something that I have to do that you wouldn't just hear, you wouldn't just be cut, but that you would be cured by the word of God, that we would be able to put these things into practice. That you and I would be able to do what the church has done for over 2,000 years and simply allow the spirit that was given to them and given to us to change us from the inside out together as church. Let's pray. Father, as we... Um, get ready to come before you now and continue our, our time of worship through communion. As we come before you now, even as we continue through a time of, of prayer right now and worship as we're about to sing, Father, help us to celebrate, to celebrate the truth that even though these things we are reading were recorded for us over 2,000 years ago, our church is still here today, still adoring God. Your plans haven't changed. In fact, the distance between now and then has only been strengthened by the fact that your church continues to grow and hearts that are cut are changed and turned back to you. So Father, we thank you for this church. We pray that you would help us to be the kind of dream team church that can only come about if we put into practice the very things that you have laid before us today. And so we'll continue to praise you even now as the God who gave the spirit that lit the flame in the hearts of the believers in the first church, that that same flame would burn dark, red, hot in our hearts as we adore you and your son from this point until we see him in glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.